Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to episode number 39 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. We've got an interview with Josh from Razor Edge Knives. But first, Bob, we want to talk about a couple of things in the in the news this week. Yeah. I guess uh, one of the things that you really wanted to talk about was uh, Spartan Blades and uh, K-Bar Knives uh, are going to uh, go in together, kind of partner, uh, a new company, if you will, Pineland Cutlery. So what's, what's that all about? Tell me about that. Well, I saw that in uh, Knife News this week, and I thought it was really cool because I've always admired uh, Spartan Knives. I think they're all of them, all of the fixed blades really um, uh, resonate with me. And, and a couple of their uh, folding designs I, I really like too, but they're somewhat priced out of reach. It's a small company out of North Carolina. It's two, I believe, former operators that got together and started up a tactically um, angled knife company, uh, I'd say like maybe seven or eight years ago. And, uh, you know, as I said, I've admired their designs. They're, they all have a, a Greek mythological theme in terms of their naming. I always wanted one, but they were always a little bit out of reach. Now they are teaming up with K-Bar and kind of, um, well, K-Bar will be adva uh, taking advantage of Spartan Blades designs and Spartan Blades will be taking advantage of K-Bar's manufacturing capabilities and they're going to come mm -hmm. out with this new line uh, called Pineland and they're going to have three levels of production, a gold, elite, um, I don't know what the middle, and then a bronze. So basically, you can get into a Spartan designed knife on one of three tiers of accessibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to me, this is exciting. This is this is the way I will get into Spartan knives. And okay. so I guess they're going to keep their elite gold class as kind of um, uh, sort of a continuation or uh, annex of the sort of higher end stuff coming out of Spartan. So mm -hmm. it'll it'll be interesting to see how uh, a small company like Spartan and a large company with a history and, um, you know, uh, deep roots in the industry to see how they come together, see what mm. they, they come up with. All right. OK. Well, when you told me about this, I was intrigued because uh, Spartan Blades is uh, out of Southern Pines, North Carolina. I grew up in uh, Fayetteville, not too far from Southern Pines. Oh, uh, yeah. Of course, folks uh, in the military are familiar with uh, Fort Bragg. That's mm -hmm. uh, right there beside Fayetteville and, of course, close to Southern Pine. So you mentioned a former uh, couple of operators, uh, yeah. perhaps, uh, I don't know, 82nd or Army or something like that. We'll have to find out. Maybe we'll uh, get them on to talk about that uh, their uh, their company at some point oh, sometime that in the would future. Be, that would be cool. And Fort Bragg, that's where where they train a lot of uh, special forces mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Army, I think. <laughs> yep, Army. And then there's uh, Pope Air Force Base right there, too. Oh, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, a lot of, a lot of military history right there in uh, Fayetteville. But uh, another thing I wanted to quickly mention, Bob, uh, everybody's, uh, you know, kind of celebrating the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, the moon landing, the cool. Apollo 11 moon landing. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, things around our hometown uh, here uh, near Washington, D.C. They uh, did some kind of a special movie that they sh they put up and showed on the Washington Monument yeah. at night. And, yeah, I was uh, actually speaking with Drew Swift, a guest on the show. And he went down there, brought his daughters down there, and um, he said it was really, really amazing to see um, is this this high def film that they uh, projected on the Washington on Monument. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so cool, and and you know it was of the uh, rocket taking off. Yeah, and all, all yeah. That. Well, and of course, uh, knife tying into that, uh, Victorinox has uh, announced a limited edition mm -hmm. of the Tinker model. Uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary and interestingly, uh, limiting it to just 1,969 pieces. I wonder why they did that, Bob. 1,969. 1969. Such, hmm. a, such a specific number. <laughs> right. <laughs> but a uh, question I wanted to ask you real quickly yeah. before we get into the interview with uh, Josh from Razor, Razor Edge Knives. Um, we talked about this a, a lot, you know, a base model with, you know, new cover, <laughs> new this, new that kind of take advantage of limited edition or commemorative or those kind of things. Your thoughts on that and how it kind of relates to other collecting of, of knives, different models, those those kind of things. Just general thoughts about this. Yeah, well, um, this example of Victorinox case is also uh, a, a, um, a great example of this where every year they come out with um, the same models, 
uh, you know, it's like Hollywood, the same but different. Every every year they come out with the same models, but with different uh, commemorative handle scales and, uh, you know, different colored covers. Sometimes, uh, you know, Victorinox will do a special edition in ALOX. That's their um, aluminum handle. And it just makes them imminently collectible. It's kind of kind of a Spyderco dips their toes in there, too, but they're nothing like... Uh, case or victorinox i mean you look at uh smoky mountain knife works for instance who has a huge stock of case knives and victorinox knives and you can go page after page after page looking at a victorinox tinker or classic or whatever it is with different colored handles different um pictures different pictograms different uh commemorative holiday messages this and that and like case knives every year they come out with uh, their christmas knives and they come out with uh so yeah I'm loving looking at all this Apollo 11 stuff right now. You, even Forged in Fire did a uh, an episode where they had to build the, the knife that was taken up into space. Mm. And it's actually not for use in space. It's for use once they land, if they land on some desert island or right. you know, right. uh, self-defense or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or or chopping down. Coconut. Survival. Yeah. 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 yeah so I'm, it's really cool to see uh, the knife industry tie into this like amazing historic uh, landmark. Mm hmm. Well, and also, uh, as we've talked about in uh, recent editions, uh, kind of the reduce and refine uh, kind of mentality, it also goes to your collecting style, whether you want to have uh, one brand, one model, and variations of, of, of each, yeah. that kind of thing, which seems to be this kind of production model, if you will, or, right. or different model. So it's, you know, to each is all, different tastes for different folks. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. It's a, just different styles of collecting. I'm always amazed when I see on um, Instagram, I'll see someone posting a picture of like, these are all my paramilitary twos. And there are, um, you know, I don't know, 17 paramilitary twos sitting on a table. And they're all the same knife, but they all have different blade steels, different handle materials. Mm. And um, I totally respect it. That's not my, you know, my thing is like kind of a touching Everything that's a little bit different, you know, I, I mm. love knives that, you know, are different from the other knives, but right. uh, which is kind of the opposite of this. But I, I really, I really respect that kind of collecting. Someone just really loves that paramilitary, too. And they're going to get yeah. every damn color they can get. Right, right. I, well, think it's that's, cool. I can't remember what episode we talked about, but that's their style of collecting. So mm -hmm. that's what they want and, and makes them happy. So, yeah, go for it. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Josh. What, what do we got uh, coming up for? What can we look forward to hearing? So Josh from Razor Edge. I, so he's someone that has been on my radar for a long time because he does these absolutely stunning um, modifications and enhancements to production knives uh, that people send him. He, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm very, became very interested in him because he thins out uh, a lot of hinderers. You see him work on a lot of hinderers, but he does, he works on everything. Uh, but he'll thin out the blades of a hinderer with, with these beautiful, um, very thin hollow grinds. And I was like, hmm, I need to do that because I have a couple of hinderers and I love them, but they are kind of wedge like. So I started looking at more of his work and noticed, you know, he does everything. He does, he does anodizing. He does, uh, regrinds. He does, um, he'll make new handles. He does, uh, reblading even. So you send him a paramilitary too, for instance, and you say, I want a completely different blade. Let's work on it. Let's figure out what it is. So here's a guy who uh, who left his his old line of work. You'll find out what that is, and uh, just you know slowly but surely, you know, got himself into the knife game. And you know, I guess people will know by now. I love that. I love these small ancillary businesses that support the knife uh, industry. I, I just think it's inter interesting that people can make a living doing things to enhance other people's hobbies. I think it's cool. Right. So uh, I talked to him and he's just a great guy. And uh, yeah, we just have a, we have a great chat. And after uh, speaking to him, I, I was uh, fully, fully committed to sending in my, my Spanto XM18. I'm going to have him hollow grind it. So uh, the knife junkie podcast leads to more expenditures for you. <laughs> well, it's, it's all in the name of research, Jim. That's our, there you go. I got to know right. what I'm talking about. Let's write that off. All right. <laughs> hey, that interview with Josh is coming up. But first, I want to remind you that you can uh, take uh, managing your small business finances to the next level. You can focus on growing your biz while QuickBooks Online handles everything else. Now, we've got a special link for you where you can get 50% off your subscription on either QuickBooks Online or or QuickBooks Self-Employed for the first six months of either purchase. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks 
Get started with QuickBooks Self-Employed or QuickBooks Online today. Small business owners who have a to-do list that, uh, you know, never seems to end, well, you need QuickBooks. If you're looking to simplify your business finances and your life, check out QuickBooks Self-Employed and QuickBooks Online at a special discounted rate. Go to theknifejunkie.com slash QuickBooks. All right, Bob, one thing before we get into that interview, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, we've been having website issues, and yep. uh, which has led to, uh, I don't even understand, it has something to do with the RSS feed, but our, our podcast is not getting out to Stitcher and uh, Apple Podcast, all the different podcast players over the last couple of weeks. Yep. We are working on it, yep. hopefully sometime soon, but just, it's you know, uh, folks need to be aware. <laughs> yeah, it's an astronomically uh, frustrating situation but but we have the best minds in the industry on it that's you and me and your buddy and, <laughs> and uh, some other minds not <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we will get to the bottom of this of course uh, un, un, until that's fixed hopefully that's fixed this weekend uh, of course the podcast will be going up on YouTube and then once it is uh, remedied everything will be pushed out to all of your favorite uh, podcasting outlets mm-hmm. iTunes Podcast apps, Stitcher players, yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah. So uh, I've gotten a number of emails, people saying, what is this? And now I have to sign in and give a password to hear the podcast. You don't, it's it's a mistake that's happening and it will be fixed. Yeah, our, our apologies, everybody. So uh, hopefully we'll get that uh, resolved soon. But as Bob said, if you need to and want to get your uh, weekly fix of uh, the Knife Chunky podcast, you can listen to it on YouTube. Just go to thenifechunky.com slash YouTube, or you can just go to youtube.com and uh, type in the Knife Junkie podcast, and you'll be able to come up with a playlist of uh, the most current issues as well as the archive and uh, maybe catch up on some that you, you haven't heard uh, before. So uh, thanks for bearing with us, everybody, and hanging in there with us as we resolve to get this fixed. Ever watch video reviews of knives you already have just to justify your purchase? You are a knife junkie, and you've come to the right place. Josh from Razor Edge Knife, thank you so much for coming on the show, first of all. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. I, I've been uh, an observer of your work on Instagram and now on YouTube for you know, quite some time. And I think the first time I really uh, started looking a little harder at your work was when I saw the Dr. Frankie video, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and I love him. We had him on the show uh, a while back and he mentioned you again in that show. And uh, I I just think it's very interesting, the um, progress going from uh, a, a blade enhancer, a knife enhancer to knife maker. And I, I just wanted to ask you, how did you get into modifying knives? How did you get into knives in the first place? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, Frank's a really good guy. He's uh, he, it's, it's kind of funny because when he first contacted me, uh, ended up finding out he had a same same area code phone number that uh, I've got, and I was like, "Are you a Greenville?" He said, "No, no, I used to live there." So he's a, a local guy, so it's pretty cool. But uh, but yeah, so basically, um, I uh, I worked at the sheriff's office here in Greenville for about ten years, and um, it's starting in 2005. And for the first three years, I was just uh, working on the road and uniform patrol. And I remember, you know, we were working a lot of night, night shifts and that kind of thing. And, uh, so I found this sharpener and I, was, I told my wife, I'm like, man, I, you know, I, I really want to get this. I don't remember exactly why I wanted to get it, but I just wanted a sharp knife and, and it always kind of fascinated me. And, uh, and so got the spider coat sharp maker. And, uh, so it was, it's pretty funny because I remember, I remember we'd have, we'd used to have to work, um, night, uh, about I don't know once every month or two on the the front desk just taking reports when people would call in and uh, you know it'd be kind of dead getting around two or three in the morning so I'd whip out the sharp maker and I'd I'd just take my uh, you know kitchen knives or a friend's kitchen knives in and you know I'd, I'd <laughs> the guys would tease me about uh you know sharpening these these big old kitchen chef knives on the, the front desk when I was working but <laughs> uh, but yeah it was, it was pretty it was fun but so that basically. Um, you know, started off sharpening and then I, then I remember I was, I was like, I was like, oh, babe, I found this knife sharpener. It's like my birthday the next year or something. I was like, I found this sharpener, um, that I, this is the last one I'll ever need. I, I've done all this, this research and it was the Edge Pro Apex. Oh. Um, yeah. And that was a, that was a, that's a great, uh, a great system for just like home sharpening guided jig system. But, um, but yeah, so did that and uh, started doing that. And when I found out, I was like, oh man, I can get an edge on uh, on knives. It just 
just like, well, I'm going to start doing this for money, try to get a little extra income in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and did that, did that. I started advertising on Craigslist, got like a $10 website and, uh, just slowly started building it from there. And, you know, slowly started rolling the money into more equipment and, and, uh, kind of like that. So, uh, in the sheriff's department, you were obviously carrying a knife, I'm sure. And, and, and around that culture. Yeah. So, when did you make the step from from just sharpening people's knives on sharp makers or on the Edge Pro Apex to send me your five hundred dollar hinderer and I will you know work right. my magic thinning out that chunky blade? So I moved from the I moved from the Edge Pro Apex to the Wicked Edge and that's what I still use today. Mm-hmm. And because um, I, I just absolutely love that system. And so what what happened was I ended up getting a belt grinder and. This is just like a, like a spare bedroom of our house, and um, <laughs> and so you know, I, I was that went back for I didn't use a mask or anything, and you know there'd be a cloud of abrasives around me when I was I'd be grinding in the spare room at our house. Whoa! But um, yeah, it wasn't very smart of me, but um, but yeah, so it was somewhere around. I ended up getting um an enclosed trailer because I was thinking, oh hey, I want to do this mobile sharpening thing, you know. It, the other guys do it. And a cow spider co started basically. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And uh, so I like, mean, I'm gonna try that, and it turned out it didn't work out work out so good. But um, but I I think that was somewhere around 2011 or so. And and I remember when I, I had this, uh, it was like an eight by sixteen enclosed trailer, and I had all my equipment in there. I had used this, some no weld grinder plans from uh, USA Knife Maker, and oh, yeah. built my, built my own two by seventy two finally. And, and so what, you know, I remember the first, the first knife I think that I reground was, um, spider codes for a guy in, uh, I don't know, he was in another country. Um, and so, but he, he sent me several and I, I, rem- I remember before that I was like, oh man, Tom crying, he is the man. Like I've got to learn how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I just was like, man, I'm gonna take a plunge and, um, and just, you know, started started learning how to grind. So know. so when you really ground into your first uh, production blade, uh was it one of yours? Did you did you kind of cut your teeth on something cheap of your own basically before you uh Yeah, I think I practiced a little bit and I want to say I don't think I started off like freehanding. I think I built a jig and um you know this table like a piece of angle iron and and uh and fix the blades at that but um but yeah it was it, it's definitely a learning process you know doing freehand grinding but every knife maker i'd read like oh yeah you you've got to learn how to do freehand grinding you know well so you start regrinding these blades and then i start noticing uh, you start reblading them and to me it's now it's in a different now it's in a different place don't get me wrong. Your uh, like, I'm thinking of the rebladed uh, Spiderco uh, Paramilitary Two that you did somewhat recently. That I think it was like a recurve Tanto, and it had this really cool like humpback swedge, and and it was just a really wicked looking blade. And then it was on a pair of two handle, and I'm kind of like, yeah. like, like I don't get it. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't get. I, I mean, I get what you did. What you did was beautiful. I don't get the instinct to take a pair of two and just change it. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I. Honestly, I just, uh, I have, you know, I get customers from all over the place with all sorts of ideas and it's really cool. It's neat to me to just to be able to, um, you know, try to make that happen for them. And I'm not like a super creative individual by myself. So it's, okay. I find it very helpful to, um, you know, just people send me pictures and say, Hey, can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's awesome. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so it basically just started off doing grunt, you know, regrinds and stuff and slowly moved into, other various mods and and um you know then in in 2015 was when i finally took the plunge to switch over to doing this full time and uh at that point i ended up upgrading to shop i'm in right now which is a 12 by 40 and 12 by 40 shop and oh. um that's been a huge blessing so nice so you can you have all the space you need to get your stuff in there yeah well it, it's it's still crammed uh, <laughs> But I'm really thankful to have it. So. so you say you're not creative. You're not a very creative person, but you look at the work you do. And first of all, it seems like you have a handle, like a very excellent handle on pretty much all processes of of um, enhancing a knife. You not only have the grinder chops, but, uh, you know, everything else, the, the, the coating of the blades, 
Uh, you anodize too, yeah? Well, I do, yeah, I do heat anodizing. I just do it to bronze. I tried the electro anodizing thing, and it's just, you know, it's kind of finicky, especially get up to the high voltage colors. And then customers don't expect when, uh, you know, you get finger oils on it, that it changes colors. And it was just kind of a, one of the things I didn't really want to mess with. But. That's actually one of the um, qualities of, of anodizing, tit- you know, colored anodized titanium that I like because it's sort of uh, analogous to... Um, high carbon steel patina, you know, which I'm also yeah, a sucker yeah. for, you know? Oh yeah. I love it. So, I mean, I, I would, I would want that, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I find your, your work really creative. And, uh, and, and like I said, especially, oh, thanks, yeah, yeah. Especially what you did with that, with that pair too, even though it was not for me, the blade yeah. was, but just not on that handle. But right. really what you're saying is, um, and this is a theme I keep coming back to, and I don't know if it's because of my, my own, livelihood you know i'm in, involved in production which is all collaboration you know uh, as, as yeah. a producer the the, the you know, your strength is in finding the best people at that job to do the thing and mm-hmm. and uh produce the vision and with you it seems to be the same thing these are you're not just taking orders from people and you're not just doing exactly your thing you're going back and forth and kind of arriving at a design yeah yeah that's true um yeah i mean <laughs> And that, that is one of the attractive things to me is, is the creativity aspect of it. I mean, I don't, you know, really view myself as like super as creative as I would like to be able to put that way. But, uh, but I, I, that's a very attractive thing to me to, to, you know, as I'm trying to switch over into, into more production and, mm-hmm. um, custom, you know, actually doing my own thing is, is the fact that, Hey, you know, I could design this and just make it. And just so, but I mean, obviously still accepting input and that kind of thing, but, sure. Uh, pretty cool um so so you're doing cad design which is man cool. yeah it's i, I <laughs> it's a learning it. curve huh <laughs> yeah it really has i started trying to you know about a year ago i guess i, I had started um i started yeah, man i really i really want to learn cad i want to start making stuff and so i was you know, doing all this research all this research on different programs and uh you know try and draft site and these different 2d programs and i, I don't remember who it was but um I think it was a friend of mine from church. He's like, "Hey, yeah, you uh, you need to just do 3D, man. Just right off the bat, don't even mess with the 2D stuff because you can learn 3D up front and you can still generate 2D files from that." Um, and yeah, and so I, I was like, "Okay," and I was reading up a little bit. I was like, "Oh, you know, Fusion 360," and just really started pouring myself into that. And it turns out it's not super difficult. And uh, there's a lot of great YouTube videos online. And and I finally just within the last month figured out how to do the, the last part of what I needed to do to, to be able to design my own folder fully in the CAD and simulate the opening and closing. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's so awesome. I love it. So what, what are your inspirations? You're Now you're designing knives on CAD. That's that's pretty sophisticated. But Josh, you must have a lot of knives coming through your hands. Does that help you in any way in your design process of your own work? Yeah, yeah, it really does because... Um, you know, I get to see what I like, what I don't like. And, uh, and so, you know, I've always been really about, really about function, you know, the, the way that a knife feels and operates definitely before the way that it looks, but it's also, it's gotta just look good. And, and, um, so I don't know, just kind of, you want this perfect blend between the two. Mm-hmm. So when I'm like, when I'm making this fixed blade, for instance, I did a post on blade forms like, Hey, what do you guys think about this? any ideas, changes I should make. Cause now's a great time because it's in the prototype stage. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so I get these different design inputs and you can't please everybody. But, um, mm-hmm. but then what I did is I had it 3d printed uh, in plastic and oh, I got that in yesterday, I think. And so I get to really feel, man, how ergonomic is this handle? How does it feel? That is cool. It's, it's amazing. Because you can look at it and get a, an intuitive idea of how it's going to feel. Right. But, but that, that's still not the real deal. So to have it printed out in plastic, that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of the advantages of living in the age that we technology that we we have, you know. And and so you know, so that's that's kind of the the thing. I I don't know. I pull from just really whatever whatever advantages I see in different designs. My my main focus or thing that I absolutely love to do is um, that I really am working towards is, is folder making. So, um, and I feel like it's been, um, you had made reference to it earlier, just learning the different aspects of a folder 
um, you know, that, that has come slowly and it's come through a lot of different trials and errors. And, um, you know, it started off just, you know, so it was like, hey, can you make my detent stronger? Uh, I saw a YouTube video where somebody drilled out the, the hole in the tank to make the ball sit deeper in there and, and you know, and just slowly started learning, making mistakes. And I've had to replace a lot of knives, but I never, never want to leave anybody hanging on something that I made a mistake on, you know. So you've had to replace a lot of knives. I'm sorry to, to go right to that, but that's, no, yeah. that's the, that's the big fear. Like I would imagine that's the big fear. Yeah, I have. And I mean, I have, but it's one of those things where it's like, if it's something that I don't feel comfortable working on, then I'll be like, you know, I, I just, I just turn it down. But it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying like a lot, it's, it's still semi rare, but in the course sure. of the last eight years, you know, it has been, I don't know, I probably, replace 10 or something and 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 so it's one of those things where it's like i do limit myself on the work that i do for for people and i say you know i, I limit myself to like a 700 dollars limit and make it very clear up front like hey you know i am freehand grinding this i could slip and something could happen it's pretty rare that that happens but but you know once in a while it does and i want to make sure that i can afford to replace this for you if anything were to happen you know right right let me ask you this question, and this is something that has come up uh, when speaking with uh, oh, when speaking with Jeff Blauvelt. He learned the hard way about customizing custom knives. Is that right. something you would ever do if someone sent you? Uh, you know, I have a I have a handmade Peter Rosenti, but eh, can you take a little off the back or whatever? How, yeah, how, how yeah, do you feel about that? I don't know. I mean, that's one of those things that um, different people have different viewpoints on it, and. For me, that's not a problem, and I try to approach it from the aspect of, okay, well, I'm moving into this arena, the, you know, production and custom knives, and would I want somebody to mess with one of my customs that I made for mm -hmm. a customer? And the truth is, is that I don't care after they purchase it; it's theirs. Yeah. If there's something that doesn't fit their hand ride or that they want changed on it, I'm totally good with somebody, you know, modding my knife. Um, so if a customer comes to me. Um, you know, a lot of times if it's something where it's uh, a warranty issue or a D10 or lockup issue, then, I, you know, my first recommendation is to certainly contact the maker. But right. if it's something, there, there's a lot of guys that are saying, hey, I can't get a hold of the maker now or the maker is over in another country and I don't feel comfortable sending my knife out. And so, yeah. you know, they just they I built that rapport with them and they just want to uh, like me to do the work. So there's that's, that's pretty rare to do on a custom. But but yeah. Well, an interesting, uh, another interesting concept that this is making me think of that has been raised in, in the conversations I've had recently is the idea of designing to sell by looks on the internet, because the chances are, are great that like where I live, there are no knife shops. That's just not, uh, yeah. not, not happening where I live. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, big cities that, that are, are the same way. And uh, oh, yeah. big, big suburban areas that are the same way. And if you're a knife enthusiast and there's a knife you have the hots for, you pretty much have to buy it unless you're in a and, and then resell it if you don't like it or whatever. If you're in mm -hmm. a uh, maybe a pass around group, something like that. Uh, what do you think of that concept? Designing yeah. a knife to look good on the Internet. Yeah, right. that's um, I, I think that that's a really valid point. I mean, you know, when you have um, like you said, we're in a super technological age. I mean. You know, just with all the social media and everything else, it, if it, if you can't, if you either take just a terrible photo or, um, or the knife itself, you know, doesn't look good and looks bad, then yeah, I mean, people definitely aren't going to buy it. So, um, you know, you, it's one of those things where the, the attention to detail, I mean, I, I feel like generally the attention to detail that somebody pays in their knives, you know, is, going to probably transfer transfer into the, the pictures that they take you know and that's yes that's not a hard and fast rule i mean you know you, you may have somebody that doesn't like to mess with cameras and and you know that may not be their thing and they might make amazing knives so um that's, that's not a hard and fast rule but no no but usually uh, i i think i agree with you people who are spending a lot of time their blood sweat and tears on these labors of love that they're selling and you know it's, i would imagine it's it's not the easiest row to hoe um, you, they're going to take the time to make the knife look good in the pictures. And, and the only time I noticed just now that we're having this conversation, the only time I noticed that it's not is when they're shot pictures. And I love that too. It's just like, it's like, you're there. You mm -hmm. know? The yeah. 
the dust in the air, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm really, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of wanting to focus on you know, just, just recently um, is, I don't know, trying to just let my customers get to know me a little more, do some more, mm-hmm. you know, stories and videos and that kind of thing and shop tours and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff on uh, on my Instagram and just, you know, try to bring people along the journey because it's fun and I, I love it. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you think about it, you walk down the street and you see a construction site and you almost always see at least one man standing there observing making sure everyone's yeah. doing everything correctly. People love, well, men in general, men in, men yeah. particularly, but I think, uh, you know, like my mom would, would really be, she loves Forged and Fire. She'd love to watch these kind of videos. Any creative yeah. person is going to love that. Yeah, kind of yeah, see, absolutely. See how the sausage is made. And also, I got to say, when, when I'm watching people grind, and I have very, very, very limited personal experience in grinding on, on my home Sears uh, belt grinder, it's nervous. Hey, I started on. I started on the Craftsman 2x42. So that that's was, that's uh, what I have. That's yeah. a pretty awesome machine. Yeah. You know, it is, man. If I, I feel like if I can learn how to grind well on that someday, when I get yeah. a 2x72, I'll be I'll be Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah, you're right, man. It's, if you if you learn how to grind on that, you're gonna be you're gonna it's gonna be amazing once you switch over. It's like it's it's kind of like dragging a piece of metal on the ground while you're driving 70 miles an hour. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> you will not slow yep. down. Yeah, you're right. So tell me a little bit about your process. Um, um, and, and now I'm talking about the knife enhancement. Okay, so you've had correspondences with people. Yes, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And you agree yeah. on you agree on the uh, strategy or the concept. And then the knife arrives. What goes down? Yeah, so uh, basically, I try to I try to streamline every, you know, I'm just a, a one man show and my, my wife helps me a ton with the social media side of things, but, mm-hmm. um, but as far as the work, um, you know, pretty much it's a one man show. So I got to try to, um, optimize my time as much as possible. And so basically it starts out is, you know, when somebody wants to send me something, normally I'll get some sort of contact first, um, especially when it's more of a major mod. And, uh, but then I just direct them to the, the mail in knife service page on my website. And it's got a, I, I have this thing on there. Um, it's a Google doc. And so they just click on it and it, I don't know, You've ever used the, have you ever used the Google Docs before? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. It's a super, uh, it's very convenient for businesses because what it basically does is as soon as they input all their information, it takes all that and they submit it. Nobody has to print any forms off. It automatically takes all that info and inputs it into a spreadsheet for me. So I have, awesome. I have all of my orders on, in a spreadsheet. I know what's coming in. I know what's gone, what's gone out. I'm just trying to stay, you know, super organized with that. So yeah. after I get the nice in, then I basically change something in that row and I say, Hey, yeah, I've got it in. I, I email them say, Hey, I got your knife in. Um, and then, and then I'll confirm whatever the, the estimate was and the quote, whatever I've told them and just uh, kind of confirm that with them. And after that's confirmed, basically I've got a, you know, this turnaround time, um, where I just put it in a certain, you know, in a line and, you know, whatever spot in my shop, depending upon the, whatever the work is. And, and then I get to them as soon as I, as soon as they're next up in line, kind of like first come for sure. What are your favorite knives to work on, like uh, brand wise? Oh man, um, I don't know. I, I would probably say that probably my all time favorite is Hinders because you know there's a lot that you can do to them, and I really love. Probably grinding is probably my favorite uh, my favorite thing to do. So the Hinders just have that low saber grind with thick blades, so they're yeah. really <laughs> they give you a lot um, to work I, with. Huh? <laughs> yeah, they give me a lot to work with, and uh, so I've had a lot of fun with those over the years. I have two XM 24s. Uh, I believe they're Gen 4. It's before they came out with the uh, with the triway pivot. And then mm-hmm. I, I have a Gen 4 uh, XM 18. And I love them dearly. I grew up in Ohio, and and Rick Hinderer is from Ohio. That's that's only a, a minor part of why I like them so much. But that's that's my justification for never getting rid of them. You know, like <laughs> I, I have yeah. a very hard time letting go of knives. And um, but the one thing about these is is I have kind of moved. Um, more in my in my personal taste, I've moved more towards a thinner blade. You know, it they right. just really kind of cut better. And 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 I mm. though though uh, I'm loath to admit it, I do not have any type of adventurous life where I need a a, a hinderer at all. It's just mm-hmm. a luxury yeah. item. Yeah, and you know, you might want to check out the uh, they they have traditionally ground ground their blades uh very they're very thick they're i don't know somewhere 
somewhere around 30, 35 thousandths. Um, right there at the shoulders of the edge, you know, at around 25 degrees per side. So they're they're really thick and ground obtusely. And yeah. um, I was actually pretty impressed with uh, DLT had an exclusive uh, run of hinders and uh, of like they're like Gen Six with this wedge on the back and it's a blade shape, you know, a little different. But they're actually the ones that I've handled have been like they're they've actually been impressively thin for a hinder. Really? Yeah. You want to check one of those out, Dan? Oh wow, that's great! Another five hundred dollar item. I need to go. <laughs> right. So, do you have a collection of knives yourself? Like, what what do you like? What are you? No, I don't. And that's actually it, it's pretty funny because I work with so many collectors, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't. I I don't have the collection. Um. So my last knife that I I the last knife that I had sold. You know, last main knife I had sold about six months ago. It's a Shirogorov neon, and uh, oh, so sh- yeah, I'm sorry, I, you said a Shirogorov, right? Right, right. Oh God, they yeah, are beautiful. A sure yeah, yeah I, they are, and they're. I mean, their their action is just amazing. But I I basically sold that to fund this uh, this run of folders that I'm doing. So oh. or to help, obviously didn't fund it, but again, just put that money towards it. So right. I find that super advantageous to be able to look at knives that that I have been impressed with action wise, mm-hmm. you know, like a Shiro or, um, or Grimsmo, um, mm-hmm. you know, these kind these knives, I can check, I can check a lot of things on them, you know, with the caliper and that kind of thing and just mm-hmm. check the, well, how do they have the lock bar, the lock bar set up? What's the tension on it? You know, when you have it at 50% and you want to just fully disengage it. And, you know, it turns out that Shiro's are around two pounds. It takes about two pounds to disengage. So, <laughs> You know, that's what I'm going for on my own folders is uh, is trying to kind of replicate that action. So It's sort of like how we reverse engineer UFOs. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, if you believe in that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so you don't have a collection. Obviously, you must have a knife of your own. And, and I'm curious. And right. I'm going to guess, since you're a former law enforcement officer, I'm going to guess you have a bench mate. <laughs> no, I did hear uh, a, a previous podcast where you said that. Yeah. Uh, no, the... Uh, um, I, I actually, I have had, um, I have had a couple bench mates in the past, but, uh, but no, I, I, surprisingly enough, what I was actually, my first, one of my first, um, you know, nice quote unquote knives that I got, um, uh, was a Kershaw blur oh. and that's what I carried with me. So, um, but what I carry right now is a, uh, it's just my own, it's the, the prototype for, uh, for the Kuros that I'm. That's the name of the knife that I'm making. So you know, it's just the prototype for that. And it's like I went out, I went like out on a limb and just did this like crazy. Uh, it's a, I don't know, it's like a modified Tonto Carambit oh, blade shape. Yeah. Really weird. No, I like that. <laughs> a recurved modified Tanto Carambit. Yeah, you're you're talking yeah, my language. It's crazy. So, um, in your daily knife use, what kind mm-hmm. of tasks? What kind of tasks are you doing? with this i mean i'm talking about i'm talking about the knife that you made that you're carrying right so mainly um mainly i'm just like you know cutting open boxes or packages or i you know it really varies depending on what i need i had a piece of uh on this on on this particular blade i had a um i did dlc code it because i was uh testing testing one of those out you know one of the dlc coatings at the time and so i had it coated and uh and so I, i had this piece of like you know that kind of corrugated plastic roofing that you put on like a like an animal house or something yeah. like that yeah yeah it's like kind of a translucent green kind of right yeah yeah, yeah so I, I had a piece of that and it was like really dirty and so i'm just like you know i i, I had to like you know cut some off that would fit inside the trailer or whatever before we took it to the dump and uh and so i just you know took it out and cut through it and i mean like the dlc and everything held up amazing with the blade everything held up amazing but yeah i mean just you know random stuff like that or I, that doesn't come up too often, but you know, a lot of times I'll just be out. Um, you know, we, we've got a little bit of property, so I'll be out. You know, and, and we have this like little field area where the kids play, and um, you just be walking around there, and you know, hack some branch. I, I won't hesitate to hack a branch down that you know might be yeah. half an inch to an inch thick or something like that. But yeah, so I basically, uh, you know, that that kind of tells me through some uses is, is uh, okay. Is this really set up right? Is this going to yeah. generate hot spots? you know, that kind of thing. 
So well, that's what I was going to get at. Like the, uh, since, you know, this is a, a prototype, something new, you're, you're kind of, um, you haven't had an opportunity to do a lot of testing of stuff, but right. now that you're carrying it around, are you happy with it? Are you getting good information about how to continue forward with the project? One thing I learned not to do, and I wasn't planning on doing this on the project, but is not to put, uh, I, I use these like the spalted mango burl bolsters because I was just, you know, I was going mm. all out. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did that. And it turns out you don't want to do that on a liner watch. So I was hacking a branch with it and, uh, and I missed and it, the branch hit that bolster right, you know, right where the liner disengages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it knocked yeah. a big chip out of it. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, that kind of stuff happens, but I'm, the ones that I'm making are going to have, you know, my card of scales and that kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I get to learn, I get to learn, um, you know, just learning how, how it feels, how the lock works, uh, how it holds up. Um, although I'm going to be doing the, the seal inserts on, on these others. So the first one that I'm going to be making is going to be my own and I'll be able to put it through the ringer. So, so, uh, you're saying you're going to put the steel inserts cause it's what it's going to be a titanium frame lock. Yeah. Titanium, no titanium liner lock, but yeah. Titanium um, liner lock, but you're going to put steel. Yeah. on the. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know if I've ever seen that the steel interface on a titanium liner lock, but I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty rare. The reason I think why a lot of people don't do that is because you do have to have thicker liners. So I'm using, I think they're going to be 90 thou thick, somewhere around in there. And uh, there there are a couple knives that do it. There's a, I don't remember which shear drive model it is. But they have one like that. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's doable. Um, I had this mod one time where I, I had a uh, K2 Farad Spider Co. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a and, big knife. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a big knife, a big frame lock. And, so he, my customer's like, hey, can you put uh, coconut fiber, um, you know, from Shade Tree, can you put the coconut fiber scales on this and turn it into a liner lock? And I was like, ah, you know what? I, yeah, let's do it. So it, it turns out the squares were, the scales were square enough to where, you know, you could make that work. And it, it actually turned out really nice. I was, I was happy with it. That's cool. I, I, I never liked the shape of the blade of that knife. Right, right. But but the uh, the wavy it has sort of a wavy cutout for the liner lock if I'm remembering correct or for the for the frame lock is that right the the leaf yeah I, I think you're I think you're right um I think just you're right kind of pretty yeah yeah it's you know and that blade shape is uh not you're not alone because other people have uh, have had me mod that blade shape it kind of um, doesn't know yeah. what it wants to be is it Persian is it yeah. a Bowie what well, you know yeah <laughs> so so where do you see Razor Edge and it's Razor, not Razors. I'm sure you get a lot of that. Yeah. Where do you see Razor Razor Edge knife knives going from here? Like in ten years, what do you what what do you hope to be uh, achieving? Yeah, I. Well, you know, I basically I don't know. Yeah, I've talked I've talked with my wife. Uh, I was talking with her. You know, I don't know. I guess it was last year, sometime middle of the year, and just really wanting to move into production. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm not getting enough time with my family and mm-hmm. that kind of thing and um so it's like yeah you know i think that's a smart a smart move you know just even thinking forward till you know 20 years down the road retirement and everything is you you don't want to be in a position where you have to be in the shop putting in the man hours mm-hmm. um to be able to bring income in um i mean i still have to put man hours in but it's not going to be as labor intensive as it is right now and uh you know thanks to cnc and that kind of thing but right. So I'm really wanting to move. I think that's a, a really smart business move, um, you know, for my family, at least uh, it is just season of life. So trying to, so in 10 years, uh, I'm really wanting to be into doing uh, production runs, uh, 200 blades at a time and being able to, so, so yeah, kind of that, that Hinder um, Emerson type model where you're gotcha. doing the, the production thing and doing, you know, then, then you can, do, do the customs on the side and kind of have fun with it and mess around. But what I don't want to get into, um, what I'm really trying to stay away from, and it's really hard coming from a kind of from a, a mod background is as I'm starting to make these things, having people ask, Oh, can you change mine up? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, huh. and you know, I, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be like, no, I'm not going to do it. But you know, I'm just trying to, yeah. trying to kind of shy away from that. And just my, my goal is to basically make something, listed up for sale this is here it is this is what it is you know that's i i really respect that mode of uh you know i, I went to just for a little context i went to art school and uh to me huh? 
I respect that uh, that model. And and I totally respect the custom knife model too. It's just not what cool. I would choose if I were if I were uh, making a living making knives. I think I would probably temperamentally be more apt to do what you're doing and or what you aim wow. to do. And um, but but uh, you know I think the CAD your whole decision to start designing on CAD has already started you on that path. Obviously, I mean because now you speak a universal language with all people who manufacture and all people who have mm -hmm. computer uh, 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 CNCs. Yeah, it's super beneficial. How, how do you feel about um, this uh, in the last five years uh, upsurge of really high end manufacturing from China, uh, OEM manufacturing? Would you be would you uh, do OEM manufacturing also or you would like to stick to that kind of small batch production, uh, Chris Reeve, Emerson, uh, Hinderer kind of model? Um, I don't know. I, I can't say that it's um, are you talking about doing like a collab or something yeah or like like, a, having... like something with we or drop or or, or riot or you know one of those kind of right gotcha. yeah I, I can't i can't say that uh that i'd be opposed to that at all i you know i, I just i'm not sure you know it's just one of those things that you'd have to weigh at the time and see mm -hmm. which uh you know which model it is what what you've designed that kind of thing but yeah i wouldn't say that um that i'm opposed to that but my goal my, my, what I really, really want to do is be able to get my own CNC and run everything in house. So I can have really, really strict quality control. Cause that's one of the frustrating things that, you know, I've, I've come across just in the last you know, six months to a year or whatever mm -hmm. is, you know, you run into these frustrations where something doesn't get machined right or, or, you know, there's a, a delay in it's estimated delivery time and, or, or when you get the parts and you got to send it back and then they got to be corrected. And, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just, um, I, you know, the good thing is, is that, is that basically I'm, I'm handling all the, I set it up. So I'm, I'm handling all the critical areas. So, you know, all the final fit and finish, the blade shape, the blade grind, the detent work, the, the pivot area, the lockup, I'm handling all those critical things, you know? So, um, so yeah, I, I would, I would love to be able to get into, um, somehow figuring out how to do my own fit in those larger numbers. Well, I think that's uh, I, I've been I've been paying attention to the knife market it, itself, but also how all of these small businesses or, or ventures have cropped up around it in support. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for mm. Micarta. I buy Micarta scales for for my, you know, for all my hinders. Me too. Yeah. Sweet. One. Oh, you can't see. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for this this aftermarket uh, sort of concept. And, and it, you know, it's, it's sort of a scaled down version of someone who, who buys a Corvette and then, you know, takes it to the shop and has this and that done to it, you know, just to yeah. make it yours, make it exactly how you want it. People are spending, I'm spending a lot of money on knives. I hope my wife's not listening. And uh, <laughs> oh, I should say over the years, I've spent a lot of money on knives and I, and I'm right. trying to realize that maybe if I um, handled them all, um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have bought many of them because now mm -hmm. I'm seeing the ones that I have, the ones that I'm tweaking and that I'm getting sort of uh, aftermarket pieces for are the ones that I'm carrying all the time. So anyway, my, my point is I, I think it's uh, encouraging to hear, you know, your, your story, you're, you're, you're someone who uh, has a company that is uh, a, a supporting company, if you know what I mean, uh, of the knife mm -hmm. uh, industry, you're making people's, you know, collections better and all that. And now you're, you're, you're moving, you're progressing to making your own work. And I don't know, I think it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And, and I'm, you know, super thankful for all the support that I've had over the years. Just, uh, you know, everybody let me work on their knives and, uh, being able to, you know, learn as I go along. I mean, it, you know, they don't make college for this, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but at the same time, they should. I, uh, you know, I know, right. Um, but yeah, just being able to just pay attention to the details and kind of making it how, how, um, customers like, but yeah, I, I love, I love my card. I just got this, I don't know, it's got the feel to it that I just, oh, yeah. I really love. Me too. And the look and, and how it, it, yeah. it, it also patinas. So how can people get in contact with you? How can people find more of your work to look at? You know, how can people find out more about you? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking. I, so the, I don't know. I'm, there's two main routes, I guess, is, um, one of them is through Instagram and this is at, at Razor Edge Knife. And then the other one is I just, 
it's probably been a week or two ago. I just uh, got my own sub four on blade form, so that's that's pretty exciting. Oh, that's cool. And um, yeah, and so just being able to, um, you know, one of those two routes, I would say, are, are the best way to kind of follow the work. I, I also just like within the last week launched a uh, newsletter where basically um, whoever's on that list, whenever I do, you know, go to drop like one of the next really really things that I want to do ASAP is I'm, I want to make a, a batch of 100 uh, milled clips for the Para 2, Para 3 to fit the Pison. Uh, I, w- I want to make, uh, do 100, 100 batch of those. And then so the people on my newsletter will get, you know, basically first notification on that. Those clips sound like they're going to sell like hotcakes. I mean, whenever I try and get an aftermarket clip, you know, on one of the big uh, purveyors, boom, they're gone immediately. Yeah. I hope so, man. I, you know, I'm really wanting to be able to, um, I've only been to Blade Show once and that was, uh, did you guys get to go this year? No, we did not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a bitter weekend for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right. I know. I really wanted to go too, but, um, but I'm hoping to go next year. And so kind of one of my goals for that is, um, is to not only have knives for sale, but also to have these other things like, like have, you know, some aftermarket things, you know, clips you know, pride tools, that kind of thing. Just, you know, I think that there's, there's a market there for that. And, and people like that, especially if you can design a really good, like a really good clip that fits ergonomically, you know, fits ergonomically, it looks good. good and is better yeah. than whatever the, the, uh, off the shelf clip is that they put on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you got it. Josh, it seems like nothing about you and your work is off the shelf, which is, uh, why I wanted to talk to you. I, uh, I really admire the work you're doing and, uh, I was going to wait till we were off air to tell you, but I, you know, I, now I'm sending you one of these hinderers. <laughs> I'll probably end up <laughs> sending all three, but I'll start with one. But uh, I, I really Thanks, admire the, the work you're doing. I think it's beautiful. And, and I think your wife does a great job with the Instagram photos if she's the one who does them. Cause you know, that's half of what reels you in. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful for her. And thank you, man. That's uh, oh, um, my, my I've been pleasure. able to do what I do and work, work from home. I'm actually getting ready to post a, a, uh, you know, stay tuned on my Instagram. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do more stories. Like I was saying, and I'm going to do a video of just kind of me, you know, this is what it's like going to work every day and walk into my shop. So yeah. you're going to get a, get a little preview. That's, that's great. I, I hope everybody watches that. Cause that's kind of, uh, you know, that's what everyone likes to see. They like to see how the sausage yeah, is made, especially when it's not sausage. <laughs> that's right. right. And Josh, thanks so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. All right, Bobby, another uh, pretty good interview there with Josh. Really like uh, hearing uh, his his story. And yeah. What, uh, you kind of know this question is coming. Uh, key thought, key takeaway. What did you really enjoy from your conversation with Josh? Well, yet again, I've met another like very cool person in the knife world. So that was great to meet him just because. But I've been admiring his work for so long. It was great to talk to him. And and for me, it was uh, really interesting to hear his, his uh, slow evolution out of his old job, you know, working for the government and the sheriff's, the sheriff's department. And then slowly acquiring tools and skills at the same time so that he made a transition out of obviously out of a job he didn't want to be doing into a job he does want to be doing. And uh, to me, that's that's uh, inspirational because that's a, a path I'm also on, except, uh, you know, uh, in, in a different s- s- state of it. Aren't, aren't we all on that? Path? <laughs> I hope no you one know. from work is listening. No, but, uh, <laughs> but but, you know, I think that's I think it's normal. Everybody wants to. Uh, you know that old say, uh, saying, if you do something you love, you'll never work at a day in your life. Yes. So if you, I think that's everybody's dream is to get to what they really enjoy doing so they don't feel like they're working. That's but, exactly but, right. But can yet sustain a, a livelihood for themselves and their family. Yeah. And be surrounded by knives all the time, too, which oh, is awesome. cool. Just an extra <laughs> bonus. And now he's at this stage where he's just about to start making folders. You know, he's just about to start making knives and uh, he's on the cusp of something new and exciting. And uh, to me, that's uh, the, that sort of energy is is uh, contagious. Mm. All right. That is going to uh, pretty much wrap it up. But first, want to give you a chance to uh, plug next week's show. What, do we, oh, yeah. what, what can we look forward to? Well, so next week we'll be uh, speaking with Ian Pekarski of CMF Metalworks. He's um, a n- 
relatively new knife maker uh, who's just making outstandingly gorgeous and complex and uh, oh yeah, I, I, I saw he, some of the pictures on his he, Instagram. Wow, yeah, he's making some beautiful folders now. He was uh, he he sort of cut his teeth. Uh, in in uh, Jeff Blauveld of Tough Knives in his shop in Pennsylvania, I learned a lot from him. And uh, you know, these are now two guys whose whose design work and whose knives I I I admire incredibly. So it's cool to see one great knife maker coming from another great knife maker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just getting better and better all the time. Yeah. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. want to thank you for uh, listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And again, we hope to get our, uh, our RSS problems fixed soon. But if you can't find it in your podcast player, by golly, just go over to YouTube and uh, you'll be able to get your uh, weekly fix of the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.